Okay, right, I think we are finally in business. Now, this is a brand new talk, and I've had to research this subject specially for Genetic Genealogy Island. I cannot guarantee that I've got everything right, because it turned out to be a huge subject to try and bring so many different strands together. But I'm going to be looking, first of all, at a sort of historical perspective of identifying missing per persons, and then at the um, identifying missing people the, uh, through um, the national and uh, international DNA databases, and then the use of genetic genealogy to identify missing persons. And all of this is raising actually some very interesting questions. It's only doing this process of drawing all this information together that you start to realise all the, the questions that are arising. So I see this as an opportunity for initiating a discussion on how we actually go about doing these searches, and I hope that you'll find some of the information useful here. I'm going to start actually with a, um, a personal story from my own family history of a, uh, of a missing person in, in my family. And this is my uncle, um, Gerald Cruz, who was born in 1921 in Cork. And he was a navigator in World War II, and uh, he was based first of all at RAF Tempsford, where he was working on the, the Moonlight Squadrons, who used to drop um, SOE agents in occupied France. And then he transferred to Bomber Command, and he was uh, in, involved in some of the bombing raids on Berlin. And then he transferred to 635 Squadron and was part of the elite Pathfinder force. And these were the, um, the planes that went out at the front of the, you had a sort of bombing mission, and they were the ones who were at the front, laying the way for all the planes coming behind so that they had the targets where they knew where to shoot. And he went missing on the 20th, the night of the 20th, 21st of April. The story was covered in the local paper, which was at that time was in Cheltenham, where the family were then living in Gloucestershire. And my grandparents received a letter from the uh, leader of the, the squadron. And I'd just uh, blown up some of the, the part of that. They actually had a telegram from the, uh, uh, the, the squadron. And here, here is the, uh, the text from the telegram. That's, um, so they're basically saying, your son's aircraft is engaged in an important mission against the enemy. We are not in possession of any details. And it often takes a while for the news to reach us. But they're clearly trying to maintain the, the, the hope that there's going to be uh, that he's going to return. Experience up to the present has shown that quite a fair proportion of our flying personnel who are reported missing in operations against the enemy have managed to make a safe descent by parachute or in the aircraft itself. So there must be some hope that your son is safe and a prisoner in enemy hands. So there was a long gap. My, my grandparents heard nothing. And then nine months later, they sadly got the news that they did not want to have. Um, and the, um, they'd found, what they'd, they'd, they'd had reports of a night fighter being shot down um, over Belgium. And uh, they, the bodies were buried in a churchyard there. And the identification was made, as you can see the bit that circled there, from a piece of tunic that carried his name. So there was no DNA testing in those days, but the, um, the identification um, was, was confirmed. So last year, we actually took my 90-year-old father to visit the, uh, the war cemetery to see where his uh, brother was uh, buried. And it's the most beautiful uh, setting. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission do a fantastic job of maintaining these cemeteries. And on the right, you can see the, the gravestone there, which mentions my dad and his, uh, his two brothers as well. But the one thing that struck me, this was actually the first time I'd visited one of these um, war graves, was just walking around the cemetery, the sheer number of gravestones for soldiers who are unidentified. And the, it's just the, the, the sheer numbers of people involved. It, that it, it's difficult to bring home that message. But I don't, did any of you go to see the, the display, the poppies at the Tower of London? Right, um, <laughs> because I think that, to me, that was just the world, the, the soldiers who died in World War One. But every single poppy, there were ceramic poppies. They were planting them um, uh, throughout the the course of the exhibition, and it's just sh seeing the sheer numbers and knowing that every poppy represented one person really brought home to me the the scale of the horrors of a, a world war. But there are many reasons why people go missing. So um, war is, is one reason. Um, we have natural and man-made disasters, floods, tsunamis, uh, bombs and everything. So the picture on the right, that is the, 
uh, um, the, those are the, uh, the victims of 9-11, photographs of nearly 3,000 people who lost their lives on, on that day. And there's a museum in New York where they've now got uh, a special display where you can actually see all of those photos and they're all displayed on a wall, just showing again the sheer scale of the, of the horror. Um, people also go missing because of government actions, so we've seen that in you know, places like Argentina, Mexico. Um, they can be a victim of murder, kidnapping, abduction, abduction suicide, um, accidental death, or just a death by natural causes when they don't happen to have any ID on them. But so the first um, class I'm going to look at is that people who die in, war, in wars. So we've got a number of um, official organisations that actually take responsibility for um, uh, trying to find these, um, the remains and actually commemorating the remains. So the Commonwealth War Graves Commission is the, the, the big organisation that takes care of the, the 1.7 million men and women who died in the First and Second World Wars. And there are around about a million burials at, um, over in various uh, sites in over 150 countries. But that still means that there are literally thousands and thousands of men for whom they have no known burial place. And those families have no, nowhere to actually commemorate their relative. And even today, the work goes on, and this is just one that I found at random, um, of a First World War soldier who, whose who remains was found and he was laid to rest 100 years later. Um, so, and apparently there's a, an average of about 30 bodies that are recovered each year. And the, the, even the, the number of people who died in the, world, in the two world wars is still not known. Um, there's a project called the In From The Cold Project who are trying to identify people who are missing from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website. And I've actually helped that, this process with um, one person who was actually in my one name study. And I came across a Tom Rutherford Cruz uh, who died of malaria in um, a place called um, Gravidnosk, I think it was, in, in Russia, which is now part of Turkmenistan. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't find his name on the um, CWGC website. So I came across this project and I wrote to them. And the family actually had a number of letters surviving from that time. So we sent off an application. And then eventually, after it took nearly a year for the process to go through, they actually added Tom Rutherford Cruz's name to the register. And they have actually been responsible for adding nearly 6,000 names <coughs> to the CWGC website. Uh, another big project that uh, Morris spoke about uh, the other day is uh, Fromel in France, and this was a, um, a grave that was, um, was uh, there was actually an amateur historian in Australia who who uh, speculated that there might be a big uh, war grave here. So a team of archaeologists from Glasgow University decided they they excavated here, and they actually found 250 human remains. And this was actually a, a massive um, genealogical exercise uh, because there were 1,650 soldiers who were identified as missing after the Battle of Fromel. And there were 250 recovered soldiers on the, on the list that they'd found. So the, the, for this project, they used Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA testing, and they needed to get families, reference samples from the families of those 250. But of course, they don't know who the 250 were, so that meant they had to get samples from all the relatives of all 16,500 people, 1,650 people. So in other words, to trace the families, so they had to trace all those families to get the, ident the uh, informative donors and that meant that they needed, in theory, 6,600 donors in order to identify 250 soldiers. So you can imagine the amount of genealogical work that's involved in that uh, process. And the, um, after the identifications were made, the, the soldiers were all buried in a new um, cemetery in, in Pheasant Wood. And the, the total number now that have been identified out of this 250 is 159 but I'm sure that there, there, there's still scope to identify more soldiers in the future. And Morris has um, set up this commemorating the missing project, 
And the idea of this is that you plant a family tree with the DNA record so that if there are other soldiers who come forward who are missing, um, you've got that um, reference sample there. So you plant this on the, um, it's Every Lives Matters problem. Yep. Everyone remembers. Everyone remembers, I guess that's it, which is a website from the Royal um, Legion. Um, but I think the important thing, it, it, it's a lot, I think the important thing is that we all need to make sure that we have family trees available for everyone to, to access, especially if you've got one of these missing people in your family tree, because the, 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 the body could be found tomorrow, it could be found in 100 years' time, and that information needs to be there, and the DNA information needs to be there somewhere. There is the International Committee for the Red Cross, and they don't seem to get quite so involved in DNA testing, but they've been around since 1863, and they are responsible for, when there's an armed conflict, they will go in and make sure that any response is appropriate and, and sort of correct humanitarian procedures are, are followed. And they have published a, a booklet um, back in 2009 which looks as though it needs quite a bit of updating with protocols for using DNA to identify human remains. Now there's a, a massive project or uh, a massive um, organisation called the International Committee for the Missing uh, for Missing Persons which was founded in 1996 by President Bill Clinton and it came out of the G7 summit at the time so it's actually his, in, his initiative to do this. And this was actually uh, as a result of the, the, the conflict in the former um, Yugoslavia, when they had the prospect of trying to identify all those bodies uh, who were um, after the, the, the war had ended. But they now work with governments and organisations from around the world, um, focusing particularly on um, conflicts and human right abuses and disasters and things. Now they have a massive database, they have their own database management system, and they have profiles with information of, for over 150,000 missing persons. And they are collecting information and DNA reference samples from the families of the missing, as well as doing all the um, forensic um, and archaeological work. And then they have uh, the DNA profiles and the DNA matching in their database. Their laboratories are based in The Hague in the Netherlands, and they have the, the capacity to handle um, DNA from d decades old mass graves and very, very difficult cases. And it's actually now the world's largest missing persons testing program. They've tested 50,000 bone samples and they have a, um, a family, 100,000 family reference DNA profiles. And the main tests use Y-DNA, mitochondrial DNA and autosomal STRs, which are different from the markers we use in our autosomal SNP tests, which I'll explain a bit more about later. They are also pioneering the use of um, next generation sequencing, mass massively parallel sequencing technology. I wasn't able to actually find very much information about uh, that programme on their website, but I'm sure we'll he'll hear more about that in the future. And they are dealing with missing people from all over the world. So with the uh, conflict in Yugoslavia, there were 40,000 um, persons reported missing. And they were able to account for 27,000 of those, about 70%. But they've been working on programs around the world and even in countries like America, um, they were involved in the 9-11, um, uh, the identification of the victims there, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. So it's a, it's a real international organisation and they, ha they have resources globally. There are certain standards for investigating these cases. I won't go through all of these now. A lot of them have come out of UNESCO, uh, but there is a, now a very good framework for um, the, the protocols which, which should be followed for investigating such cases. And the I, ICMP has also published some of their own guidelines, um, focusing particularly on issues of privacy and permission and can, making sure that any, any measures taken have to be proportionate and adequate and not, must not be excessive. And there are also a number of more local um, initiatives. So one, uh, I won't go through all of these, there are far too many, but one in particular that I picked on is the, the Polish genetic database of victims of totalitarianisms. Uh, and there's a paper published about this. Poland, um, there were six million people who died um, in World War II as a result of the um, at, at the hands of the Nazis. And I was actually in Warsaw in September 
And if you ever get the chance to go to Warsaw, there's the um, Museum of the Warsaw Uprising, and you can actually, they've got a reconstruction, and you can, uh, it's a sort of a film where they've reconstructed what Warsaw would have looked like at the end of uh, 1945, and the whole city was essentially completely flattened, and it, there was just a few hundred people left in the city. Um, and they've now done a wonderful job rebuilding it, and they've also reconstructed the, the old town. So uh, it's a very interesting place to, to visit. But one thing that struck me on reading about this was the need for getting the reference samples while you still have the chance, because so many of the people, the last people in their generation with the, you know, the Y DNA or the mitochondrial DNA, so it's just so important, I think, for all of us to make sure that we get those samples in the database while we have the chance. And now we move on to the, um, the, the criminal databases, which are also, are by extension also used for um, making, doing the official investigations of uh, missing people. So the UK National DNA Database was actually the first of its kind in the world. And it, um, uh, DNA fingerprinting was invented in the UK in 1984, Sir Alec Jeffries. And the database was established in April 1995. So data is held from all four countries which make up the United Kingdom, um, but there are slightly different retention systems for Scotland and Northern Ireland. And there are now, as of the, the most recent date I could find, September 2018, five and a half million people in the database, which represents about 8% of the population. And it's the only um, national database of its kind where the number of people on the database is actually going down. The European Court of Human Rights a few years ago decided that it was a, a violation of human rights to keep samples on the database if someone was um, not convicted of a crime or you know, if, they were, if it was just a reference sample that was being provided. And the number um, for just England and Wales is nearly 5 million there. 80% of the people on the database are male and 19% female. And there's a separate database, so if you happen to work in the police force or you're working in a laboratory or you have to provide a reference sample for any purpose, you actually go in a separate elimination database. Uh, if, if there's a missing person in your family, it's actually a different type of database altogether. So it's not part of the police database, they keep this all completely separate. So they have a database of missing people, their close relatives, unidentified people and human remains all going in the same, same database. And there's something called the Missing Persons Unit, which was previously called the Missing Persons Bureau, um, and they, they manage all the records. And there were around about 1,826 records on the database in 2017, the most recent date there. And in the last year in which they reported, that database produced seven matches. But in total, the, the, the UK database has 778 unidentified, case, unidentified cases. And that includes not just bodies, but rather grimly body parts and 50 alive individuals who's, who do not know their own identity. And again, it's 78% suspected to be male. In Northern Ireland, there is a, um, a, they normally investigate, in the most recent year, there was around about 12,000 reports of missing persons. Most <coughs> missing people actually do get, um, they get found. But in Northern Ireland, there was a big scandal. 53 police officers, officers were disciplined after failings surrounding missing person investigations. And as a result of that, the Ombudsman recommended the establishment of a specialist central unit. And I haven't yet been able to find out if that unit has been developed. So I don't know if anyone else has any more information on that than I have. Scotland seems to be much more advanced. They have their own, they've recently done a big review of their missing person investigations. They've now, and in 2016 they did 22,000, 62% of them involving children, and 56% of the missing there were men, 44% women, and 99% of people were found safe and well. But sadly, 91 adults were found dead and 16 are still missing. And their database goes all the way back to 1957, and they've identified 732 people on their long-term missing list, and they're now starting to try and collect 
reference samples from the family members of all those people on that list going right back to 1957. Uh, Ireland, uh, the database, the police database in Ireland only launched on the 20th of November 2015. And it's administered by Forensic Science Ireland. And it's currently located at the Garda headquarters. But it's been the current facilities have been designated as not fit for purpose. So the plan was to move everything to a new fit for purpose building. Um, over at um, Back Western in County Kildare, but that project has been delayed indefinitely over lack of tenders. It seems to be a common feature with forensic science. There are cutbacks. Um, forensic science um, in England, the, the, the body was all, that was also um, uh, cut completely, so it, it always seems to be a lack of funding for, for such important work. But in the Irish database, they have um, 21,000 profiles in their database, but that represents just 0.5% of the population. So compare that with 8% in the UK DNA database. And as with the UK, there is a separate missing persons index where they again hold samples from unidentified remains and they can get DNA from clothing, personal belongings, and then you also need to get the reference samples from the Relatives. So the samples are submitted through the, the Garda and 48 samples were taken from relatives in 2017 and they had nine successful missing person identifications. And these are the statistics which I found for um, Ireland going right back to 2003. And you can see the, the number of people reported each year, but there's always every year a small number of people who are still outstanding. Um, and so there's still a large number of families still not having any closure about the, uh, the, the whereabouts of their missing person. Ireland has the, the, the world's first national monument to missing people. And this was set up by uh, the Joe Dullard Memorial Trust. And um, Joe was, uh, it was actually a, a relative of hers who, who, who set this up. And she went missing um, about 20 years ago. And the, I don't know if you can see the hands on the, the sculptures there, but the hands are actually the, hand, the, the, the hands modelled on the relatives of all the, mis, of the, the missing people. And uh, it's in the grounds of Kilkenny Castle, and I, I think there's a really nice touching uh, um, inscription on the, in, the, uh, in the sculpture garden there. Uh, in America, they have um, something called um, CODIS, which stands for Combined DNA Index System. And that actually comprises three different databases. So there's a national DNA database, there are local DNA databases, and there are state DNA databases. They have more than 16 million DNA profiles, about 5% of the population. But unlike the UK, they do not, and in fact also the rest of Europe now as well, they do not have, they're not legally required to remove people from the database, but if you ask, they will remove your data from there. And these are the sources of data that they can put on the database, convicted offenders, detainees, unidentified human remains, missing persons and relatives of missing persons. So everyone seems to go onto the same database there, there's not a separate database for missing people. And the, their database stores autosomal STR data, YSTRs, and mitochondrial DNA. But the Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA is only used in the missing person cases. And America also has uh, something called NAMUS, the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. And this was established in 2007. The National Institute of Justice uh, published a report on what they called the nation's silent mass disaster. And it was revealed that there were more than 100,000 active missing persons cases and over 40,000 sets of unidentified human remains. The scale just seems unbelievable. Um, so on this database, they have what's called a decedents database. That was a new word to me. I had to look it up in the dictionary, but that seems to be a legal term used in America for a deceased person. Um, and there's a missing persons database and an unclaimed persons database. And an unclaimed person is someone who does not have any next of kin who has claimed them. But interestingly, there is no requirement for the state to upload data to this missing person database. 
and as in from as of February 2017, there were just 12,000 uh, missing people on that uh, database. Um, 11,000 unidentified and 2,500 unidentified, unclaimed persons. And it's estimated there are 600,000 people who go missing each year in the US. And there are 4,400 unidentified human decedents. And 1,000 of those still remain under, unidentified after one year. So that's a huge proportion, almost a, 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 almost a quarter. There is um, a very, uh, this um, scientific working group on DNA analysis methods has uh, set some protocols for the way that some of these investigations should be done, but they haven't actually updated some of the, um, the recommendations uh, for quite some time, 2014 and 2013, which is a, a lifetime in the, the DNA world. Uh, but they also have special guidelines for missing persons uh, casework. They meet twice a year to come up with these uh, guidelines. And I just wanted to explain before I go on to talk about genetic genealogy about the different types of um, tests that are used, different types of markers. So in forensic investigations, they use markers which are called autosomal STRs. STR stands for short tandem repeats. So a short tandem repeat is... Oops. Okay, so you can see up here, it's, it's like a little motif that's repeated in the DNA sequence. And if that's repeated 13 times, then that, the value for that marker is 13. And they, can, they do these things called electrophorograms, and you can see that for each marker you get a peak like that. But of course, one of the difficulties if, is if you're dealing with DNA from, say, a crime scene or a missing person, you know, a body that's been, ident been identified sometime after the, the person had died, you may not necessarily get a complete profile. So you may only get a partial profile like this, which makes it much more difficult for doing the matching. And the other thing that you can get is you get a mixed profile. So that's especially the case on a crime scene where there may be DNA from two or more people there. And if that was the case, you, what you would see is not just one peak there, but you would see multi two peaks or three peaks, depending on how many people were, um, uh, who, were who, how many people's DNA was actually mixed up in, in the sample there. So in the, in the UK and Ireland from 2014, it's uh, now 17 markers that are used, and 16 of those are short tandem repeats, and then there's one sex marker. So that gives us a total of 32 numbers, because for each marker you get one from your mother, one from your father, and then it also it reveals whether the person was male or female. And in America, they use twenty. They now use twenty markers. That's with effect from first of January. Previously, they used to use thirteen. We used to use ten in uh, Europe, and the DNA seventeen is the standard kit used now throughout Europe, I believe. So uh, when they use these uh, STR markers, what they try and do is to work out a match probability. So they will come up with a match probability of something like one in three million. And that's based on the frequency estimate of how rare the profile is in the population. But if you have a match probability of one in three million in a population like the UK, that means that there are potentially still 20 people who could have that same signature but you then have to compare the data that you've got with all the other information. So it's highly unlikely that, the, it, okay, you've got a match probability of one in three million, it's highly unlikely that any other person was, would actually fulfill all the other criteria for the crime or for the missing person. And if you have a perfect match between the STR profiles of two DNA samples, then there are three possible explanations. And I think this is something that people haven't really considered, especially with some of the, you know, with the, um, the Paraben and the Golden State Killer investigations. Just having the match on its own is not the only explanation. So that is one reason why a person's DNA could match. It, the, the person is the suspect or the missing person. But another reason is that there may be a second person who has an identical DNA profile. And that would happen if you had twins. Um, and we can actually quantify this because we know that about one in 1,000 births are, are, are actually identical twins. If you don't know that a person was an identical twin, then you'd have to take that possibility into account when doing the mathematical calculations. And the other um, explanation is that the match is a false positive due to a sample switch or some other kind of error. <coughs> 
Um, and there's a very useful little booklet if you want to understand more about forensic DNA. The Royal Society published this booklet for, um, for use by courts, which goes into some of these uh, issues in, in great detail. Um, and they've also included in there a very interesting table about error rates. Um, so you, this is, again, something that could be factored into the mathematical analysis to produce the probabilities. So the, the error rates are actually quite low for most things, but you see at the bottom, if you have a mixed sample where there's more DNA from more than one person, there's an error rate of 1 in 500. So if, you've, if, you've, if you're um, going through large numbers of DNA samples each year, you, are, you would be expected to find a few errors. This is based on data just from one year. And of course, it may be there are other errors in the data that haven't yet been detected. Now, we always used to say that um, quite often people would ask us, um, uh, can the police access our genetic genealogy databases? And the answer used, always used to be, well, no, that's not really possible because the police use these autosomal STRs and we use autosomal SNPs um, for our research. So I've tried to do a comparison here. So um, the autosomal STRs, they, in the forensic databases, it can be anything from 10 to 24 STRs. And we don't really use STR, autosomal STRs at all in our um, genealogy research, although I think there is a possibility that uh, that's something could, that could be developed in the future. Um, we use autosomal SNPs in our databases. Um, in forensics, they do use autosomal SNPs, but it's not, they're not used for matching. They do use them for doing things like um, predicting eye colour and skin colour and hair colour and that sort of thing. And in the genealogy databases, we, we are now very much focused on using SNPs for um, defining branches on the family tree, but they're, again, not really used for forensic purposes. And mitochondrial DNA, forensics do very occasionally do whole genome sequencing, but it's very rare. They just tend to do what's called the control region. And in fact, it's, they, they split it up in a different way. They split it up into three different regions, whereas we're used to splitting it up into two regions. Whereas um, for genealogy, we now mostly use the, the whole uh, mitogenome. And whole genome sequencing, not generally used for forensic purposes, although as you saw, the ICMP is starting to look into that but we regularly use that um, now, well, certainly advanced researchers are starting to use whole genome sequencing in their research. And if, if you do that, you then get your whole genome sequence, you get the full mitochondrial DNA sequence, and you can also get lots of Y chromosome STRs as well. But all that changed in uh, April this year when the news broke about Buckskin Girl. And this was a case uh, in America, and she was called Buckskin Girl because of the jacket she was wearing, uh, made out of skin, and they thought, originally thought she was uh, perhaps Native American. She was found in a roadside, um, in a, a roadside ditch in, in Ohio. They originally did um, autosomal DNA testing, autosomal STR testing on her, um, with no matches in the, the CODIS database. They also submitted a mitochondrial DNA profile. And then, as we learned later, an organisation called the DNA Doe Project were asked to help with this case. And they, um, they had a, a new DNA sample, um, some new DNA extracted from a damaged blood sample. And what they were able to do um, was um, create a spoof kit for upload to GEDmatch. So that was created in, in March 2018. And they um, immediately had a match with a first cousin once removed in the database. And then they started to research the family trees. And as they searched the family trees and brought the trees down to the present, what they found was this record here of a Marcia um, Lenore King missing assumed dead. So they had essentially found the answer within about four hours of searching. And this is something, this is a cold case that went back to 1981. So all those years um, where forensics was not able to provide the answer, genetic genealogy comes along and suddenly you've got the answer in four hours there. And so there was a press conference held on the 11th of April and the, the family were informed. And the mother, um, she had stayed in the same house and had not changed her telephone number in 37 years in the hope that she would see her daughter again. But sadly, the news was not the news that she was expecting or hoping for.
Um, does everyone know what GEDmatch is? Yes? Any hands up if you don't know what GEDmatch is? Okay, so there's a few at the back. Okay, so GEDmatch is a database where if you've taken a test with one of the commercial um, genetic genealogy databases, you can upload your data to GEDmatch and then you can search for matches with other people in the database. So if you've tested at Ancestry DNA and your cousin has tested at 23andMe, you can both put your results in here and you can see whether or not you match as expected. So this is the database that was used by the DNA Doe project for the uh, Buckskin Girl case. But after the news broke that GEDmatch had been used, um, there were people who were expressing concerns about the use of what was essentially a genealogy database for, um, but for law enforcement purposes. And here's a tweet that I put out at the time. Um, sort of saying that it actually raised huge unaddressed ethical issues because the database was being used without the fully informed consent of its 900,000 users. But I think at the time I was actually in a minority of people who was expressing concerns. Most people were actually quite happy that a, an unidentified person had been identified and the family had closure and they weren't thinking about other implications. And then just two weeks later, we had news that the Golden State Killer had been identified using the same process, using the GEDmatch database. And um, you probably heard Barbara Braventer talking here the other day about how she actually went about doing that. Um, so after that, that was really when all the um, debates really began about all the privacy issues of using GEDmatch for um, these uh, forensic cases. And uh, GEDmatch, so some people argued that at the time the GEDmatch website didn't specifically stop people from uploading DNA for law enforcement purposes. So it, it, they did include this clause, we are unable to guarantee that users will not find other uses. Um, whereas others, uh, and I was amongst them, who said that you know, if it's going to be used by law enforcement, then people in the database, they should have the right to know what their data is being used for. And they should have the opportunity to withdraw their data if they want to. So um, Curtis Rogers and John Olson did actually respond very quickly. They were a bit shell-shocked at first. that they're, I mean, it's just a tiny little volunteer hobby website that was set up to help adoptees find their families um, and they they had you know, several weeks of uh, you know trying to work out what to do for the best um, but they eventually decided that they published a notice on the website first of all to alert people that the database was being used for this purpose and then they eventually updated their terms and conditions and I think it was actually very bold of them and very brave of them to make this decision because they could just as easily have turned around and said well we don't want to do this um, we want we just want to keep it for genealogy so they have now explicitly authorized the use of GEDmatch for the use of uh, for solving uh, by law enforcement but only in particular cases for violent crimes against another individual or to identify the remains of a deceased individual and they specifically defined a violent crime as so as a homicide or a sexual assault. So the DNA Doe project that, um, that, that identified Buckskin Girl, that is a not-for-profit organisation founded in 2017 by Margaret Press and Colleen Fitzpatrick. They had a Facebook page that went live on the 1st of February 2018, but uh, completely unnoticed by most people, I think, in the in the community until Buckskin Curl was identified. And they have a team of around about 40 or more volunteer genetic genealogists who just seem to coordinate their work through a secret Facebook group, as far as I can gather, and just work on the family trees and try and identify the, the, um, these uh, DNA does. It costs um, $1,700 per case, and that's for the whole, what they are doing is whole genome sequencing, so next generation sequencing, and then there's also the bioinformatics to try and work out to, uh, to, for the, uh, to, to actually create a kit and to make a spoof kit for upload to GEDmatch, because GEDmatch, um, you only want about up to a million SNPs to, for comparison purposes on GEDmatch, so they've actually 
removing a lot of the data that you get from the whole genome sequence. And they also charge an administrative fee of around about $1,000. Sometimes they, they waive that. And it's a, um, a team of three people, three people who, who are working on the biotech side. So uh, somebody called Vainang Tang from AMD Biotech. Justin Lowe, who I'm sure is known to many of you, who set up Full Genomes Corporation. And they, they do Y chromosome sequencing and whole genome sequencing for the genealogy community. And Greg Magoon is another one of our citizen scientists who does a lot of uh, analysis work on uh, an R1B and uh, the U106 project. So they've created their own methods for, first of all, characterising the level of degradation and assessing the, the chances of success, and also come up with um, algorithms. To, uh, the, one of the problems is that the, the matching algorithms may not produce reliable matches <coughs> if you don't have enough data there. So they did some uh, proof of concept studies and tried to work out ways of assessing the reliability of the output and ways of distinguishing between matches that are probably true and matches that are probably false. And now one consideration, of course, is that the methodology has, there's no transparency about the methodology and it has not been subjected to peer review at the moment. And we know that, you know, we've had the press conferences, but we've not, none of us have been able to see any of the reports that the police have had. So at the moment, we've got no way of verifying what has been done to, to say whether or not it is legitimate. But though I have good faith in um, you know, Greg Magoon and, and Justin Lowe that they, and I'm sure they would be doing the right thing. The, the second case that was uh, solved, well, solved by the DNA Doe Project is Lyle Stevick. And that was actually an alias name. And he was a man who eventually turned out to be 25 years old, who, who was a, he died of suicide in 2001 after checking into a motel in a place called Amanda Park in Washington. His DNA was put in CODIS, but there were no matches. And there was um, crowdsourced funding through the DNA, pro pro through the DNA Doe project um, to have his DNA sequenced. And in this case, they got a really good quality sequence um, from the, the sample with nearly 90, 95% of the reads mapped to the human genome. So that's about 95% of his um, sequence. And with high quality coverage, um, 38x. So normally for in sort of medical studies, they're looking at a minimum of 30x. So this is actually very, very good quality. And uh, they, the man that they, they identified was a, a relative who lived in California. They contacted the relatives and the positive, I, they got, managed to get the positive ID by um, fingerprinting the family members. But the family did not want his name to be revealed, although they, they announced on the 8th of May that they'd made the identification. But the, fa the name has actually been asked, the, the family have asked for the name not to be revealed at all. But that case was not solved within four hours. That took hundreds of hours of work by a team at that time of 20 volunteers. The third case that the DNA Doe Project has worked on is um, Joseph Newton Chandler III. And he um, was another suicide. He died in 2001. And his, his body was only discovered about a week um, later after he died. Um, and the body was so badly decomposed they couldn't get fingerprints at the time and they didn't get any DNA. I don't know why, I don't know if it, again, it was the state of the, the body, they weren't able to get DNA and his body was eventually cremated. And it was very mysterious, he left $82,000 in the bank and he had no named next of kin. And when the, they started to investigate, it turned out that he'd stolen the identity of an eight-year-old boy who had died in a car accident with his parents uh, back, way back in 1945. And he was apparently a loner, no family, no friends, and very eccentric. On one occasion, he went off on a long drive for several hundred miles, couldn't find a place in the car park of the place he wanted to visit, turned around and came back again. And there are some rather weird and strange stories about him on the internet as well. And he was diagnosed with colon cancer a few months before his death. And because he'd um, had the hospital treatment, in 2014, it, were the DNA, uh, it was possible to extract DNA from a tissue sample, and that was uploaded to CODIS. But at the time, they did not get any hits. <coughs> 
So um, it, it was actually a company called Identifinders, which is the commercial branch um, that Colleen Fitzpatrick runs in America. And she's been the one who's been involved in YSTR testing and trying to use YSTR testing to find matches in genetic genealogy databases. That, I think, is a lot more controversial than using autosomal SDR testing because the success rate is not good. And we've had two cases now of false identifications from YSTR matching. But in this case, when they did the YSTR, it suggested the surname was possibly Nicholas. And then in 2017, the DNA Doe Project took on the case and they did the, the whole genome sequencing. So in the first round of sequencing, they only managed to get 7% of the genome, and there were actually entire chromosomes missing. And the only matches that they had for um, Chandler were third and fourth cousins. And they contacted some of the matches, and the matches helped them to construct the family trees. And then in December 2017, they sent the sample off for a second round of sequencing, which produced a few more matches. <coughs> And then in March 2018, what they decided to do was, rather than have two separate files, they merged the two files together. This was, I believe, the, the first case that was taken on by the DNA Doe project. So it was still very much at the experimental stage um, in those days. And then with this new merged file, they had a new third cousin match appearing at GEDmatch who hadn't been there before. And when they looked at the tree, they found that there was a Schreiber who'd married a Nichols. And Nichols was very similar to Nicholas. So they decided to have a look at this. And then they came across a couple called Silas and Alpha Nichols who had four boys. Only one of those was still alive. His name was Robert Ivan Nichols. And they came, when they looked at the address where his parents had lived, it was 1823 Centre Street. And that was actually the same address that um, Chandler had provided in another document as a, an address for his sister, which turned out to be a fictitious address. So immediately when they found that, you know, that that same address had been used, it surely was not a coincidence. And that was one of the key factors that led to the identification. So they, uh, they were able to trace uh, the son of Philip Nichols and it, his DNA matched that of um, Chandler's. So we then had the identification that um, Chandler was actually Robert Ivan Nichols. And that identification was announced at a press conference in June this year. And that particular case, um, depending on which source you look at, was anything from 1,500 to 2,500 hours of, of volunteer work. And just most of the work is not, it, it's all the, the, it's the family tree reconstruction, because you, especially if you're working with third and fourth cousins, you've got to follow all those lines down to the present day. But the mystery still continues. Um, so Robert Ivan Nichols, it turned out, was a World War II Navy veteran. And his ship was bombed by the Japanese, and he was actually injured in the, in the bombing. But he received a Purple Heart. But um, having got home after the war, he burned his uniforms. In 1964, he left his wife and three children. And he told his wife that she would know why he was leaving in due time. In 1965, he wrote to his family saying he'd moved to California, um, but then that was the last they heard of him. And then later on that year, the family reported him missing. But he, he managed to carry on living under his um, real name for, quite a, for another decade or more. And then in 1978, he assumed a new name and a new social security number, which was the, the Chandler surname. So the theory is that he is, was perhaps a fugitive on the run, and apparently he'd been, on a number of occasions, he just disappeared and for days at a time and then came back again. So it's poss one, one theory was that he was somebody called the Zodiac Killer, who was a, a, another unsolved uh, murder case in America. So, and it may be that um, you know, one day we will get the answers to this, but we, we still don't know if there, there is some sort of criminal history in his, his background. So the DNA Doe Project, they have a Facebook page which you can look at and the, the current status is um, the four cases that have been solved. Uh, there is one case called the Sheep Flats Doe case where they've solved the case but they've had to withhold the details because it's now part of an ongoing homicide investigation. There are nine active cases, eight pending at the moment where they're waiting to get funding or they need, they're still waiting for the sequencing or the bioinformatics to be done. And two cases that are stalled because there was insufficient or con, um, 
DNA or the DNA was just too contaminated to use. <coughs> and another thing that um, has come up is um, baby does. So this particular case is in, um, I think it's Mississippi, oh no, it's in Florida. Um, a, a young baby who was only a um, few weeks old who was found dead in, in a pond. And this case has actually been taken on by identifinders. Um, but then the question remains, you know, what's going to happen if you identify a baby to try and find a mother? Um, and another case in Georgia, the US state of Georgia, where the police were considering using um, D DNA from a fetus. And this was a 20-week-old fetus that was found in the sewage system. And in Georgia, abortion is illegal after 20 weeks. And this um, fetus, they couldn't work out the exact age, but it was somewhere around that age. So again, there's all sorts of questions answered whether or not it's appropriate to do this sort of testing in these types of cases. And there's been a very interesting case in Ireland. I don't know if uh, many of you are aware of the Kerry Babies case. Uh, I can see lots of heads <laughs> nodding there. <laughs> Um, and this is a very, very sad story. Of, um, a baby was found on White Strand in uh, County Kerry. I can't pronounce the place name, so you'll have to forgive me for not saying that. But he was then later known as Baby John, which is much easier to pronounce for me. Um, and they, the, the, they, the police um, went searching for people who may be the, like the parents of an abandoned baby. And they, they went to call on a lady called Joanne Hayes. And she told the police that she had just given birth to a baby boy on her farm, and but she actually buried the baby on the farm. And the, fa the father was Jeremiah Locke, who was a, a married man. Um, and the baby either died during or after labour, we don't really know. So she eventually put the baby's remains in a, in a pond, she said. But the police then suspected her of being the mother of the baby on the strand. And Joanne actually confessed to the killing of, the, of baby John, and she was charged with murder on the 1st of May, 1984. And some of her family were also coerced into confessing as well. But they, the family then went to, to the police, and then the next day they actually found the body of her baby that, she, that was buried on the farm, exactly as she had said it, it would be. Um, so now they had two babies and one mother, and they were able to, to uh, there was no DNA at that time, so what they did was they tested the blood groups. And the uh, Joanne's baby was blood group O, which was um, the same blood group as Joanne and also of the, the, the father, um, Jeremiah uh, Locke. And the baby on the strand was blood group A. So that ruled out um, Locke as being the father, but it still left a possibility that Joanne Hayes could be the, the mother. And the police came up with this most extraordinary theory um, of super fecundation. <laughs> and um, the theory is that it's something that's very rare, and it just merits a little footnote, apparently, in medical textbooks. But the theory is if a woman has sex with two men, round about the same time, and two eggs are released, she can have twins who are effectively half-siblings. Um, so, um, Joanne Hayes was actually charged with murder on the basis of this theory, but, so they, but the case was actually dropped by the Director of Public Prosecutions, and there was a whole massive debate in Ireland about, you know, about this case and the treatment of unmarried uh, mothers and, and so on. Um, she offered to have her DNA tested in 2004, so this is a case where DNA could have actually provided some answers. And it was only this year that the DNA testing was done, and the test confirmed that Joanne Hayes was not the mother of baby John. So now the police have launched a new investigation and in trying to identify baby John. And they've started taking DNA samples in the locality um, from mothers in that area. Um, but I, I think this whole area of DNA testing babies raises all sorts of issues, whether or not we should even be doing this type of testing in the first place. And what if, you know, if, if a mother has stabbed a child and killed a child she's been suffering from you know psychosis or depression and 
what good is it going to do dredging that up after all these years? I, so I think there needs to be a proper debate about cases like this and the, whether or not there should even be an intervention in the first place. So all these um, stories have raised a lot of um, questions and there are no easy answers. I don't know the answers at the moment, so I'm just asking the questions for now. Um, should GEDmatch be used for these John and Jane Doe investigations? Mo at the moment, most people seem to be in favour of using GEDmatch um, for this type of investigation. But what is the long-term future of GEDmatch? It's run by two people, uh, they're volunteers. Um, Curtis Rogers is now 80, and he's been talking about going off on a long cruise. And what happens if he wants to go on a cruise, or he decides to retire, or you know, he, he just becomes ill and can't cope with it anymore? Um, and should there be any law enforcement oversight in the use of GED Match and in terms of you know, which cases are submitted to GED Match, is it appropriate to submit babies, uh, you know, which law enforcement cases should be sent for, to, to GED Match, bearing in mind that a lot of these cases they end up turning into murder investigations. And which genealogists should be doing this type of investigation, especially when we start, when, when we realise that a lot of the cases are effectively criminal investigations. So there's a team of 40 volunteers working on these cases. What sort of accountability is there for these volunteers? What would happen if, uh, you know, if they identified a victim of a crime and it was a close family member, somebody that in that team knew that family and, and information was leaked? That could potentially compromise the investigation. So what controls are in place to stop that sort of thing happening? What happens if the wrong person is identified? And it wouldn't be the first time. I don't know if any of you were in Dublin, in uh, Belfast. I did a talk on the Titanic baby. And the forensic anthropologist in that case uh, originally identified the wrong baby as being the Titanic baby. Well, that was with mitochondrial DNA. But if you only have a very incomplete um, whole genome sequence, it's, I can imagine it might be possible to make a misidentification. Should the law enforcement databases be upgraded? Should they be using um, SNPs or whole genome sequencing rather than these very outdated autosomal STRs? But even then, you've still got these legacy databases, millions and millions of people in these databases where you need to do the matching and they would have to be upgraded. So that would be a huge cost to do that. And should, is there some way that we as genealogists or citizen scientists can get involved and help with these law enforcement investigations? Or should there be some sort of global missing persons database? <coughs> Rather than having all these local initiatives, should we perhaps have you know, one big database where everyone can upload their, their data? Um, that's perhaps controlled not by two genealogists doing it as a hobby, but you know, where you've got a proper setup and you know, salaried people and you've got proper protocols in place. And I just want to um, end by, with this slide here, um, a quote from 1765, Sir William Blackstone. It is better that ten guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. And it's always going to be a balancing act. And I think it depends if you're the person whose child or whose relative is missing, you are going to want the police to do everything in their power to find that person. You don't mind what corners they cut to do it. But if you're the person who has, whose, whose relative has been misidentified or whose relative has been charged with a crime they did not commit, you are going to want to see more controls in place. So I think this is a question for everyone to discuss and decide where we want that balance to lie. Um, okay, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Um, you, you've done a fantastic job uh, interrogating the internet and getting all that information mm. out there and putting it in place. And I think it's going to be a valuable uh, video to look back on again and again and mm. again. And I hope you get this a chance to give this presentation on many other mm. occasions because I think this is the exact kind of information that we, the public, need to know about. Yeah. Um, I think you've raised some very interesting questions. Um, do we have mm. any interesting questions from the audience? I'm sure there'll be, there'll be one or two. One over here from Patrick Kennedy. Hi, um, I just get the 
the scene um, as set. Um, in recent uh, times, um, it has been brought to my notice that uh, all the digital uh, appliances contain a, a secret telephone. And uh, that raises the question in relation to the McCabe, the Sergeant McCabe case, where um, they were able to get, the, the police were able to get certain information. The manufacturers would say that they wouldn't do this kind of thing, but mm. I, I think it's absolutely stupid to say that. And I think that something should be done about this, uh, this um, secret telephone that's in all our um, uh, digital appliances. All right, I didn't know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question from Jerry. Yeah, so the, um, I didn't remember they named the Greg McGoon, McGoon and Justin Lowe yeah. side. Yeah. Uh, presumably that methodology as well Thank could be used, not, not just for uh, missing people, but uh, but for you know tra tracing our own, uh, like the the Barrys of Barrymore case, where you wanted to uh, identify remains of ancestors. Yes, well, that methodology was, in fact, pioneered by genetic genealogists. There's, I can't remember the person's name, but there was somebody in the ISOC Facebook group who was able to extract a whole genome sequence for his deceased father and upload it to GEDmatch. So, in fact, that was the inspiration for the DNA Doe project. I remember reading about that case. I, I did try and find the original post and the, the website, sadly, that he, he, uh, uh, he posted has now gone. It's not even been preserved. But um, there is certainly great scope for, um, as we move on to an era where we're, we're getting DNA from artifacts like, you know, sort of, you know um, like stamps, or we can get DNA, autos autosomal DNA, or even whole genome sequences from hair or from uh, bones or teeth or something. And I think we're going to see a lot of people um, submitting DNA from deceased relatives into GEDmatch or perhaps even other databases in the future. <coughs> Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, the talk. I was completely blown away. Thank you for the <laughs> teaser. You were right. Um, so, this discussion about get my, get my is really interesting because maybe here we are using, we are bending the database for another use case. So, maybe we should change the name. It's not genealogy. Maybe we should have some kind of global DNA database and people should know exactly how we can use this so it's just like it's a general comment about that because i think that some standards are missing uh, some standard in in the way we uh, we explain how we can use this data uh, the different level of qualification of people maybe some uh, genetician could be habilitated to do this analysis but not this one because they are not accredited so i have really the impression that we have a, a huge opportunity here to move forward, but at the same time, it requires really rigorous standards. So it's just a, a, a general thought here. And just another comment, um, <coughs> when we put our data, I, I strongly agree, I, I do think, and I will put also my data, part of them, uh, so it's a difficult balance between privacy and, and, and the right uh, to the law enforcement to access this. I do think that in case of violence, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean murder, and so on, they should have the right to access this. Just a, a comment, what do you think about this line and how it moves? Uh, because as you populate the database or as the technology moves forward, maybe what we can do now is completely different from what we can do tomorrow. So with the same data, but better methods, maybe tomorrow, we will be able to identify people or to, to move really, uh, really close to you uh, and almost violate your privacy. So in your opinion, how can we make this evolve and make sure that the line, the red line between your privacy and law enforcement can always be really adapted to each case? I think it's an interesting question, but I don't think there are any easy answers. I, one of the problems is the lack of funding for forensic science. Um, and as long as we've got these databases, we've got genetic genealogists like C.C. Moore, Barbara Ray Venter, they're out there, they're actually solving these crimes um, while everyone else is discussing what to do. Um, 
But I mean, I, I think there is like new technology like blockchain, I, I think possibly could provide answers because we don't need to have access to someone's whole genome to do matching. You could, and you could privatize a lot of the data. All you need to know is whether or not there's a match and how, how much people match on. Um, you don't need to know all the precise details about you know, which chromosome it's on and, and everything else. But it's the same that Ancestry DNA do, where they don't release the, the segment data, because you don't actually need that to confirm matches. Um, so I think something like that possibly could be done. But I think there, there needs to be some sort of global collaboration, and it needs to bring together the forensic community, the genetic genealogy community, governments, bioethicists, it needs to be everyone involved in this discussion. And it's, it's a global issue because anyone can put their data on data back on, on GEDmatch. And okay, it's, at the moment it's only American cases that are being sold because they, they've tested in greater numbers than anyone else. But potentially anyone could still be mixed up in any investigation. So there was one recently, the Canadian authorities, where they d identified a relative in the UK from GEDmatch. This is Im used for immigration purposes. So wherever you are in the world, even if your DNA is not on GEDmatch, you could potentially be somehow involved in a missing persons investigation or in a criminal investigation simply because you're a relative of the, of the, the person who's being investigated. That's a really good example. The bioethics recommendations are really different between Canada and UK. So at what point, how do we deal with that? I, I don't know, and that, that's something we've noticed in these in a lot of these discussions in Facebook groups, where Americans tend to have very very different attitudes to privacy than Europeans, um, and so like GDPR has completely spooked them because they can't understand. Um, they just see it as some sort of legal action that people are taking, and that you're going to be sued by the GDPR, which is not how it works at all. So that, that there are no no easy answers at all, and I, I'm just hoping that this is going to you know, start to spark a debate. And interestingly, Morris and I had an email last night from somebody from Eurofins, um, which is the big forensic company in uh, in the UK, and they're asking to have a, a meeting with us. And that was after the Barbara's talk and some of the other talks yesterday. But to your to your question, it's vive la différence, but not too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are have to leave now. We're actually over time, and uh, they've been very very understanding, al allowing us to continue with this debate. But um, lot, lots of wonderful questions, lots of uh, uh, things to discuss in the future. A big thank you to Debbie Kennett. Thanks very much for having us.